Magenta Canada and CNM Seeds present the Wheat School on RealAgriculture.com. Uh, obviously, we have Fusarium graminarium um, now in Western Canada. We're aware of it. Growers are trying to manage it, but. One of the things I've heard you say or I've read is that it's sort of, it's also changing. The population's changing. Mm -hmm. um, talk a bit about that. Well, uh, up till probably uh, the mid to late 2000s, uh, most of the Fusarium graminearum population consisted of a particular chemotype, the 15 acetyl dawn chemotype. But uh, as we went into the latter part of the 2000s, there was quite a shift especially in the eastern prairie region to the 3 acetyl dawn chemotype, which uh, it, it's a precursor for dawn production. And um, the, I guess based on all the research that's been done, the, the biggest concern is that for a given amount of disease, if it's infested or infected, if the plant tissue is infected with the 3 acetyl dawn chemotype, it will produce about two times as much uh, di deoxydevolanol as compared to the older chemotype. So that has implications in terms of grades. So you, we've seen the CGC tighten up our grading standards for FDK to try and, and make sure that we were staying ahead of that uh, change and shift in the, in the chemotype population. So is this a battle that you win? Or is this a, sort of a battle where there's small victories and we just have to manage the disease? Like, wh wh how do you describe it? Oh, that's a, a very good way of looking at it. Uh, for many disease issues, it's a, ba it's a matter of winning the battle. So you look at rust resistance, for instance, for stripe rust. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most of the varieties probably 10 years ago didn't have resistance. Now we're seeing more and more varieties with a, either an intermediate or a very good level of resistance. So that battle's won. Now, the, the, the issue there is, is there going to be a shift in the stripe rust pathogen? With, with Fusarium head blight, it's been a slow incremental improvement in the varieties that we have. So we haven't gone to complete immunity, but we've had a dramatic increase in the level of resistance and the level of uh, resistance, especially in terms of dawn accumulation in, in the infected uh, cereal grain. So there's been an improvement there. It's still not probably at the same level of control that you would see with some of the rust resistance genes or maybe th you know, some of the leaf spot resistance genes in cereals. Uh, so it's an ongoing uh, skirmish, I guess, sort of give and take. Uh, and in many cases, it's a, it's a difficult issue in that if you have very favorable weather conditions, you've got a lot of inoculum floating around of fusarium, even using a combination of strategies, so growing wheat on a non-host crop, uh, using a more resistant variety, and hitting that with a fungicide, sometimes even using that combination of strategies doesn't necessarily give you a, the level of control that you would like. It probably, no guarantees. Yeah, but, but uh, there's ways of tweaking things, and that continues to be looked at as far as the fungicide application technology, maybe additional timings rather than just one single timing, maybe a couple timings um, as it's just starting to head and a little bit later to try and extend that window of protection on that, that head. And you know, other things like research coming out of the states in that uh, resistant varieties provide benefit as far as reducing the level of head infection, but there's indications that it also reduce, reduces the amount of infestation of residue. So you start combining that with maybe irrigation management. So now you have, at the end of the season, a crop and the residue that results from that crop having less infestation levels than, let's say, a highly susceptible variety and where you didn't manage your irrigation. Mm -hmm. So you're redu reducing the amount of inoculum uh, over time. So it, it probably, at least in the short term, we're looking at sort of a combination of small strat strategies that have a small effect, trying to get some synergism between them in terms of improving our, our control for Fusarium. So when we look at the level of uh, infection or the, you know, the level of the disease that we've had in Western Canada, how does that compare to other areas like in the U.S. or Ontario? Or is, are we just kind of getting up to speed with where they've been for a while? Or are we... Uh, is this a bigger issue here? Like, what, relatively speaking? Um, you know, if you look at Manitoba, it's probably the, the issue in Manitoba and North Dakota and Minnesota probably started about the same time. Uh, Manitoba, they started to see some issues, some indication in the Red River Valley in the middle, mid-80s. But it was really 1993 in uh, Manitoba, 
Minnesota and North Dakota was a watershed year for fusarium hemp light development. Uh, if you look at Ontario, you're probably looking more at uh, maybe into the 80s where it was starting to become more and more of an issue. So um, in the sort of central and western prairie regions, it hasn't been as much of an issue up until probably the last five to ten years in that we've seen um, the pathogen, Fusarium graminearum, become more frequently found and uh, in areas where it, it starts to occur, if you're growing highly susceptible crops like durum wheat or CPS or corn, it's starting to build up on the residue. So we're, we're getting levels of inoculum that give us, ultimately end up resulting in levels of disease that are probably comparable to Manitoba. But, you know, we, we probably, in terms of our environment, you know, we're probably not on this in the same league as, let's say, my colleague uh, Richard Martin in Charlottetown, where they, they get some huge issues with fusarium head blight, you know, given... What's, lastly, what's kind of one of the things that people still don't understand about it? Like, what misconception that grow, a lot of growers still have when, they're, when they talk to you about fusarium? Uh, I think probably the issue is that it... it um, the fact that there are different species of fusarium. So it's important to know what species of fusarium you have, first of all. Uh, because some of the fusarium species have been around for a long time, they're not nothing new, and they're they're not as aggressive or virulent as fusarium graminearum. Uh, the other thing is that uh, all of a sudden a grower detects some level of fusarium graminearum in the grain, and they think that it's that's the end. They're you know they're they're crop they're going to have significant levels of crop loss, and it's just simply not the case. It, it, you know, you have to have a series of years of tight rotation, highly susceptible varieties, and you need to build up the level of infested residue in that field in order to have a significant risk. So if you're starting to find trace levels of it, it's a signal. It's like the canary in the coal mine that, I okay, I'd better start looking at what are my cropping practices, what varieties am I growing, can I try to extend the interval between cereal crops to, to try and mitigate some of that risk? And, and just learning more and more about the disease, I think, in terms of trying to stay on top of it. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Oh, no problem.